Welcome, everyone. Hello. I'm Lisa Vijos. And on behalf of Mead Public Library and 100,000 Poets for Change and myself, I'd like to welcome you today to Poetic Pairings, How Poetry Speaks. And thank you for coming out on this beautiful spring day. I know you won't regret it. So as you probably know, April is Nash National Poetry Month. And what better way to celebrate that than with today's program? Um, Poetic Pairings is in its third year. This is the third time we've done it. And what it is, we start by inviting um, Sheboygan community members to share a poem, pick a poem that has meaning to them from some time in their life and to share it, and they are paired with a poet who responds to the poem. And the response can take different forms. Sometimes it's a poem by another poet in the world. Sometimes it's uh, a poem they've written, especially in response to what the first person is sharing. Um, sometimes the two people actually go back and forth together and read one poem. And that will happen today. And you've, if you've ever seen this event before, you've heard me say that this event is kind of like dancing with the stars, but in word form. <laughs> so as you listen to the pairings today, I hope that you see the power that poetry brings forward. It can be transformative, healing. Um, raising awareness. Poetry does all these things when we listen and let it, let it do that. Um, I think that's because poetry slows us down, makes us look at things in a new way. So we listen and we hear um, things that we might not have heard before when we listen to poetry. So before we get going here, um, I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to Mead Public Library and the friends of Mead Public Library for their support. <laughs> to Jeannie Gartman for all her help in making this event go as smoothly as it will. <laughs> Um, thank you to WSCS for being here to tape us, and it will be the link to the event will be available on their website after a little bit. We have to we'll, we'll get it up there, and I'll send it out. Make sure you know it's there. And huge thanks to all the participants today who are going to be sharing, and to all of you for listening. One thing: so in your program, the first pair was going to be. Janet Ross reading a poem by Wendell Berry, and I was going to respond, but I don't see Janet here. Are you hiding, Janet? No, she's not. <laughs> so we'll just she maybe she'll get here, and we'll this is all very informal. We'll weave her back. We'll weave it back in. Um, what I'm going to do with each pair is invite the two people to come up and stand next to me, and I'll introduce them, and then the community member will go, and then the poet will respond. And you can, while your other person is reading, why don't you sit in the chair and sort of be part of the conversation together, okay? So everybody's up here while it's happening. Does that make sense? Teams? Okay, good. Okay, all right. So could the first pair please come forward and join me here at the lectern? And don't be nervous, Jose. <laughs> so Jose Gonzalez is a CAD designer at Kohler and the owner of his own business, Enterprise Global, where he creates long-term business partnerships that foster personal aspirations, social well-being, and community development. He's also a task force member of Sheboygan Well County, a movement that works to improve the health and well-being of the Sheboygan County workforce. So he's being paired today with Leanne Metter Jensen, and Leanne, I didn't run your bio by you, so if I say something wrong, you gotta speak up. Um, a teacher at Central High School, Correct. where she brings her passion for writing and learning to at-risk youth. Also correct. Okay. <laughs> Leanne is a volunteer gardener at Bookworm Gardens. Correct. And she's been a long-time member of the Mead Poetry Circle. Yes. 
where, which meets here once a month, and many of the poets in the room today are part of that circle. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jose and Leanne. Cool. So I just want to thank everyone here for coming, especially to Lisa and the great group of people who made this possible. <laughs> I have a loud voice, so it's pretty cool. Hello? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Oh, okay. A little bit. So yeah, I just want to thank you, Lisa, and uh, everyone who made this possible because poetry is very important to me. It's something that I feel like I'm able to connect and express this. Uh, I express myself from the poet's perspective as well, and I learned a lot about myself through poetry. Um, so the poem I decided to share with you is called uh, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. And this isn't a poem that impacted me. Um, it was a poem that reinforced my belief. Um, and this poem was shared um, to me by one of my good friends, Luke Worth, who's from Sheboygan. And that's who um, I, saw, I first saw this poem from. Uh, so this poem, to me, it's a poem about choices, right? We all come into um, a point in life where we have to decide. We have, we're placed in a critical situation where you know, our choices could lead us a certain way. Um, but once that choice has been made, you keep moving forward. But there's times where you stop and you think and you look back and you reflect and you contemplate on how different your life could have been if you kept on going the other way. But you know that you're, you made a choice and you got to keep on keeping on. And so you move forward. And um, you know what, one thing I've learned is that sometimes the detours in our lives teach us more about our destination. Um, and I've also realized that a man and woman's greatest achievement to their dedication to excellence is not what they get from it, but rather from what she and he become through it. And this is what this poem is all about. It's about the journey, it's not about the destination. Um, so the poem goes, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, and the leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that ha has made all the difference. Okay, I'm gonna learn from my students and read from my phone. <laughs> Um, so, one thing that Lisa didn't mention is that I also like to sail. So you'll see that in my poem, and uh, I also wanted to mention that when Jose and I first talked, we talked about this poem um, in that it really was kind of a joke, right? So that Robert Frost wrote it to his friend because they would go out hiking, and he was so indecisive, he was like, oh, why didn't we take that path? We took the, we, oh, you know, so he's always really like, we should have gone this way, but we went that way, and I guess it's okay. So he was kind of mocking himself, right? So my response poem brings in that, and it brings in a bit of the sailing aspect, too. Mm -hmm. It begins that way, a joke designed with care, a knowing smile caught across two currents of air. A sail fills with promise, and the shore begins to fade, a decision made. The waves tickle in delight, and the path seems right. Uh-oh, there we go. <laughs> then a gust emerges, the spray stings and bites, like a distant cry penetrating the solace of night. The harbor beckons, a blanketed embrace, 
But beyond, there's so much spark in that space. What difference will it make, this take? The end. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Jose and Leanne. Team number two, <laughs> could Caleb and Scott please come forward? And All right, closest to me, Caleb Klinzing is a senior at Etude High School and he's heading to Ripon College after graduation with a plan to double major in music performance and English secondary education. Caleb's worked throughout his high school years at the Northside Piggly Wiggly, where I shop, and he has been known to recite poetry at the service desk and at the register when the mood strikes. <laughs> Scott Schmidt, is an executive recruiter in the construction industry and has been a poet, actor, singer, and songwriter most of his adult life, and maybe some of his teenage life. <laughs> I, I might have gotten this detail wrong, so correct me. He's the lead singer. He was the lead singer for 10 years yep. for the band Benson Clemmy. And he's been a regular participant in the 100,000 Poets for Change events that we've had here in Sheboygan. And he is also a blossoming ballroom dancer, which I know because he's in my ballroom dance class on Thursday nights. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Caleb and Scott. Hello. OK. So the poem I'm going to read for you is called Mind by Richard Wilbur. I first heard this poem in my freshman year when my uh, creative writing teacher, Tad, um, read it out to the class, and it instantly captured my imagination. There was just something about it that clicked with me. And one of the things that we have to do in that class is we have to memorize poems. <laughs> and I've taken that class every single year of high school. and. This one is the one that was the most important to me that I've memorized. So here we go. Mind in its purest play is like some bat that beats about the caverns all alone, contriving by a kind of senseless wit not to conclude against a wall of stone. It has no need to falter or explore. Darkly it knows what obstacles are there. So it may weave and flutter, dip and soar in perfect courses through the blackest air. And as the simile alike perfection, the mind is like a bat, precisely, save in the very happiest of intellection, a graceful error may correct the cave. So it was really cool meeting Caleb, and we, we sat down at a coffee shop, and we talked a little bit about the poem and, and why he chose it. And a couple of things stood out to me. One in particular was um, that he liked the way it sounded when he recited the poem. And then you look at the poem and you say, yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty concise. And it's kind of a perfect little picture of best case scenario of what a mind looks like, right? So one line in the poem by Richard Wilbur stood out to me, not to conclude against a wall of stone, right? That picture of the bat fluttering around and, and its sonar doesn't allow it to smack up against a wall, but in reality, in real life, there's lots, of, there's lots of instances in which our minds don't work the way they're supposed to, right? Uh, there are minds that do conclude against a wall of stone, so I wanted my poem to reflect the opposite side of what Richard Wilbur reflected, and that uh, the inspiration for me was I have a couple of people in my life currently who are, are struggling in, with some form of mental illness, um, whether it be from age, or just from things not being wired properly, right? Um, so my poem is entitled, uh, My Mind. My mind is a riverbank sleeper just before the spring waters rise, but it doesn't wake me up in time to avoid the icy tide, so my mind is helicopters and rescue boats and men shouting out my name. It is teeth chattering and shivering so hard that I'm afraid my bones might break. And all because my mind lets me sleep by a riverbank. 
My mind is a broken down bike tied high up in a tree to avoid the rushing waters. Its wheels, they spin and spin and spin and never wonder once why they even bother. They're up there searching for attraction that has long been out of reach because my mind is a broken down bike in a tree. My mind is a dented up 40 ounce can, half filled with warm liquid and held in my hand. And I hold on to that can with all that I've got because it's all that I've got. And it has ties behind all that I am and am not. Try to take it from me, I will kick, scream, and bite with a rage like a devil in the blackest of night. I will fight in the ways of a depraved and lonely man because my mind is a dented up 40 ounce can. My mind. Is it my mind? If so, then why, in my own mind's eye, can my own mind and I not see eye to eye? My mind. My mind. My mind is a second-hand pair of old boots that can no longer keep the water at bay. They fit as if it might have been mine at one time, but that's getting fuzzier and fuzzier each day. I'm tired of my feet getting wet. I'm tired of these voices that keep messing with my head. I'm tired of not having food or shelter or even a bed. I'm tired. They're riddled with holes and worn out from use. My mind is a second-hand pair of old boots. My mind. My mind. My mind is a riverbank sleeper. Thank you. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you both. Ah, we have an arrival. Janet Ross is here. Yay. We're going to back up to the beginning of the program. Would you come up? Okay. All right, wait. Now I'm losing all my pieces of paper. Oh, it's it okay. Tuesday. You're good. We're good. We're gonna. I'm gonna introduce you, right. and then we're gonna share our our offering. So, Janet Ross is an artist, a weaver, a community activist, and uh, a former docent. Are you still docenting or former? No. Okay, a former docent at the John Michael Kohler Art Center, which is where I first met Janet, probably. 15 years ago. In 2017, Janet founded the Granny Caucus of Sheboygan, a grassroots group dedicated to promoting peace, justice, environmental sustainability, and women's rights. And I hope that when I'm in my 90s, I am exactly like Janet. <laughs> Do you want to come up? She's going to share a poem, and then um, I'm, I have the response. So. Take it away. It so happened that Lisa and I both went to the documentary at the Art Center about Wendell Berry. And uh, I've been a fan of his for many years. When she told me about this event, I said, well, I, there is a poem that was in my head while I was watching the documentary, and that's what I will read. <clears throat> Words. What is one to make of a life given to putting things into words? Saying them? Writing them down? Is there a world without words? There is. But don't start. Don't go on about the tree unqualified, standing in light that shines at time's end beyond its summoning name. Don't praise the speechless starlight the unspeakable dawn. Just stop. 
Well, we can stop for a while if we try hard enough, if we are lucky. We can sit still, keep silent, let the Phoebe, the sycamore, the river, the stone call themselves by whatever they call themselves, their own sounds, their own silences, and thus they know for a moment the nearest of the world, its vastness, its vast variousness far and near, which only silence knows. And then we must call all things by name out of the silence again to be with us or die of namelessness. Thank you. And when Janet gave me the poem, the line that resonated for me was calling things, what was the, <laughs> I can't, uh, wait, I have it here. Hold on, everybody. It was the line, um, and then we must call all things by name out of the silence again, which is why we write poetry, maybe. Um, why we speak to each other. So what um, resonated for me was I, rem I remembered a poem called Remember by the poet Joy Harjo. I got this book so long ago and uh, I thought, and I hadn't looked at it in quite some time, but there's a poem called Remember and it, it, you'll see, I think, why it resonated for me with what you shared of Wendell Berry. Remember. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away to night. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life, her mother's, and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember, you are all people and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, you may go back to your seat. <laughs> now let me see where I need my program. Who's the next pair? <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, oh, good. Sam, okay. So could we have Sam Gapmeyer and his two responders, Jody Harrison and Daniel Janishek, come to the stage and be ready. Okay, Sam Gatmeyer is the director of the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, and he's leading the charge right now to build the new art preserve on Indiana Avenue, which will open to the public in 2020. Sam has a long career leading museums through times of change, most recently as president and CEO of the Peoria Riverfront Museum in Illinois. And Sam let us in on a secret. He wrote his first and only poem at age six, and it was about going fishing. Next to Sam is Jody Harrison. Jody's a senior at Lakeland University where he's majoring in communications with a minor in writing. 
He's originally from Pontiac, Michigan. Yay, Michigan, that's where I'm from. And he's been writing poetry for 12 years. Jody is president of the Black Student Union, vice president of Beta Sigma Omega Fraternity at Lakeland, and they're also a member of a group known as Gentlemen of Virtue. His colleague from school, his classmate, is Daniel Janiszek. Daniel grew up in Random Lake. He's a junior at Lakeland University, majoring in creative writing. He's been writing poetry for a little over three years, and his hobbies are weightlifting and being a personal trainer. And in the future, he envisions himself writing and publishing poems, stories, scripts, novels, and teaching. So watch for that. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sam to start off. This is actually a triad, you may have noticed not a pair. <laughs> so I truly did write my first poem at the age of six and it was awful. So <laughs> I'm going to spare you that poem and read for you a, a poem that my freshman English teacher introduced me to. It, it was a time in our country when we were uh, just extricating ourselves from the Vietnam War. It was a time when every night uh, the nightly news would report uh, the American deaths as well as the deaths by our enemy soldiers at the time. It was a time of protest. Um, my cousin uh, was in the war and, and uh, I was focused on that. I was too young to serve myself, but it was a big part of my life. And so when my English teacher introduced me to the poetry of Wilfred Owen, who wrote poetry during the First World War, it seemed just incredibly relevant. And it was the first time that I became aware that poetry was uh, about more than uh, beauty and the lyrical aspects of life and love and all of those truly worthy things, but that it could also address complex, difficult, and challenging issues as well. The poem I'm going to read was written by Wilfred Owen in 1917 as an account he sent his mother of a time when his um, unit was retreating from em enemy soldiers. And in that process of retreating, the Germans were lobbing uh, mustard gas bombs at them. And uh, so he writes the account. He sends it off to his mother in 1917. And then uh, he dies the following year in action. So the poem is called Dolce et Decorum Est, which is the first part of a, a couplet by Horace the poet, the full couplet is dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which means tis honorable and proper to die for one's country. And it was a, a popular uh, phrase used by propagandists urging young men to join the, the army and to serve in World War I. So dulce et decorum est. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, Deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs. 
obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. Dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Uh, Jody and I thought it was appropriate to utilize our dual response to write an original poem uh, utilizing our, our two respective characters wh whom you'll be hearing from. Um, it also takes the, the experience of Wilfred Owen and, and Sam experiencing uh, the world wars, which Jody and I have not. We, we've lived in the time of after. And that's, that's the essence of our poem, is what happens after. It's called Weekends. My glass hydroplanes across the bar top, surfing the condensed water molecules that escape the drink. I try to watercolor your face with my wet glass. Long strokes extending from your chin, your small mouth, one line, below your drooping nose. Your eyes are big and I imagine them green as they look brown on the bar top. I start on rows of lines, your hair, that always hung and stuck to your sweaty forehead. But the water retracts into itself, ruining my water memorial. I feel you can hear my thoughts in your new ethereal status, but I can't explain it, and I won't. Happy birthday. Oora. <clears throat> Whiskey on your breath. Dirt on your hands, no time to wash them. In the corner of your mouth, a cigarette, content as it slowly burns to his death. Pain, deeper than depths where there is, there is life, but no man can ever go. I remember your birthday, so I asked for a double shot of four roses. You loved your bourbon, that bourbon. As it, as it was what you wanted on your casket, wife, two children, and your best friend. Thoughts of you shatter away, as the bartender says. You look like you just lost your puppy. I respond, yes, in my platoon. I notice the guy slowly sitting his empty glass down on the other end of the bar. The ice cubes married as they cling to the, ga to the glass that was, once was full of life. His dog tags wink at me. Were you in? U.S. Army. Oh, yeah? Where were you stationed? Fort Drum, New York. How was Staff Sergeant there? Who was yours? Staff Sergeant Murdoch. Hoorah, soldier. You were one of mine. Who was in your squad? Did you drive? Gun? Driver, Sergeant. You may have known our squad gunner who, uh, he was always thirsty in the Humvee. So he would bring along and eventually spill his purple Gatorade. That young man was deployed, in, deployed with me to Iraq. He said we would go together, the driver and gunner duo. Always talked about overseas like the target, and our Humvee would shoot out the army cannon, landing downrange at the enemy's feet. I crouch in the Humvee, cramped. His hot Gatorade breath makes me sweat, wet. Like the last I saw him, his forehead is sticky with brunette icicles, sticky. There's a grenade in my hand, heavy. Pull the pin, hold the safety lever, and throw. Pull, hold, throw. Pull, sticky. Hold, hold, heavy. Hold, hold, heavy. Throw, throw, throw at the enemy's feet. Scanning the rocky terrain ahead. I radio, possible IE, boom. The Humvee in front of me stops, ambushed. The gunner firing in every direction. One shot, the gunner slowly disappears into his Humvee. Bullets scream past our ears, carrying the voices of its shooter. I tried to recover men from the Humvee as it took fire. One, with a grenade in his hand, looking into the lifeless eyes of his gunner. I, I jolt awake, 
It is Monday morning. Thank you. I sort of got goosebumps, you guys. Um, we were just, uh, many of us were at a conference of the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets this weekend, and the theme of the conference, interestingly enough, was poetry in conversation and collaboration. And I cannot tell you, like, everything I've heard today is just making, giving me shivers because, you know, we're taking things that have been written or that are shared already and then creating these amazing new works of art and expression and I'm just I can barely speak I'm so excited so thank you thank you all for this amazing outpouring of creativity and expression so all right oh the next pair could Kyle and Georgia come up here please I'm getting goosebumps again. Okay, Kyle Welton is a graduate of Marquette University where he majored in political science with a double major in history and classical studies. Minor, double minor. I'm sorry, yeah, <laughs> minor. That would have been a lot of majoring right yeah. there. Um, he's been a project manager at Epic in Madison, a business analyst at Acuity, and and this is where I met Kyle. He was the field organizer for the Democratic Party of Wisconsin in the 2016 election cycle. He'd send me out on canvassing. He was very kind. <laughs> Kyle serves on the Sheboygan Area District School Board, and he's the president of Habitat for Humanity Lakeside. And as if all this isn't enough, Kyle is currently running for state senate in the 9th District. It's got my vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we'll, yeah, we'll keep doing poetry. Um, Georgia, <laughs> Georgia Ressmeyer, an East Coast native, has lived in Wisconsin since 1974. She was a defense lawyer in another life, and her poetry has received two Pushcart Prize nominations and was awarded honorable mention in the 2017 Laureen Niedecker Poetry Contest, which is sponsored every year by the Con Council for Wisconsin Writers. Georgia has three chapbooks published, and her newest, which is at the back of the room there, is a full-length collection called Home Body and was published by Pebble Brook Press in 2017. So, Take it away, Kyle and Georgia. Thank you, Lisa. So um, I want to give a little bit of an introduction about why I chose the Iliad um, and why we're doing it this way. Um, so for most of you who know me, know that I'm unabashedly nerdy. But easily the nerdiest thing about me is my love and passion for dead languages. Um, and, and that is, I find them fascinating and I continually, it's the, the way it forces your mind to think and I think there's really a beauty to language that expresses the full range of human emotion and there's something that um, you can, it's really hard for us to think about connecting with people who've been gone for 3,000 years. But all of it comes to life when you start to think in their language and, and, and get that. And so at Marquette University, I took ancient Greek and Latin. And in my fourth semester, we did nothing but translate Homer. And Homer is often considered some of the most difficult Greek because not only is it ancient Greek, um, it's in dactylic hexameter. And so there's pieces of it that are merged and piece all for poetic license. And so we translated 11 books of the Iliad and seven books of the Odyssey. And I absolutely fell in love with both poems, but particularly the Iliad. And the reason for that is that the Iliad um, has captivated us for 3,000 years, right? Think about this, that Homer composes this uh, just about 3,000 years. He composes it orally. He's a blind poet. He's known as the muse. He composes this uh, in 700 BC, and we still have it to this day. There are several other epics about the Trojan War 
None of them have survived, but we have both of Homer's, and they're revered and studied and actually pretty historically accurate through everything that we can find through archaeology. And so here we have Homer who composes these epics, and he focuses on 47 days in the 10th year of the war. We've got 10 years of war, and he focuses just on 47 days. But through that 47 days, we have this beautiful brushstroke of human emotion, and the struggle with the question is, why do we fight war? And that is something that has, has resonated throughout generations, and the Iliad is retold in many different stories. And so as part of our final exam in that class, we had to memorize in dactylic hexameter the first eight lines of the ancient uh, epic, the Iliad, and then recite it for the class. Uh, for some reason, I still remember that. Uh, and so I offered that to Lisa when she approached me, and I said why this had, had meant so much to me, um, and then got to, to pair up with Georgia. And Georgia does a really nice job of presenting a different side to Homer that is often not, not, not brought there. So without further ado, I will recite for you the first eight lines in Greek, and then I will read you the translation, which oddly enough, I don't have memorized, but I still have, <laughs> have the Greek. Um, so. Menena ede thea, peleia do achilleos ula menen, he muri acaios alge theke, pelas de timus sucasa idi praiapsen hero on, autus de teloria, te yuca conessen oenosi te passi, diasta te leato bule, ex ude ta prosta, diasta tain erisante, atre ides te wanak sandron, caedios achilleos. Achilles wrath. To Greece, the direful spring of woes unnumbered, heavenly goddess sing. That wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign, the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore. Since great Achilles in a tree days strove, such was the sovereign doom and such the will of Jove. Achilles um, took great pleasure in being called sacker of cities, and he took great pride in all the treasure and, and the women he was able to seize on his raids all throughout the Aegean Sea. Um, and um, uh, the women were enslaved both sexually and otherwise. The beautiful got to be concubines to the great warriors and kings, and the less beautiful got to work in the flax fields doing terribly back-breaking work and led short lives, they and their children. Um, this poem is um, my response both to the Iliad and the fact that Homer makes so little of the suffering of the women, the slaves, and also um, um, the fact that, that these, the abuse of women and the rape and enslavement and harassment and other objective, objectification continues to this day throughout the world, including in this country. My poem is titled, What Homer Failed to Say. Of women's pain in their enslavement speak, O goddess. Let the earth and heavens shriek with bitter cries as women, spoils of wars, are raped and sent to toil on foreign shores. The beautiful made concubines to men of wealth and power. Their charms imagined by warriors and kings to be sincere, not stratagems of those who held life dear. O oh, muse, declare the greed and vengefulness of ruthless men the cause of wars, to best retaliate, enslave, plunder, inflict pain and fear on others, backbreaking hunger and backbreaking work on those who survive, just to keep them, their children, half alive. Homer slighted the sufferings of women. Today we must fight to end all oppression. I just want to add that I know that Kyle Welton agrees with everything I just said. <laughs> Oh, 
after this day is over, I have to get all the pairs standing together because it's very hard. For, I, I need to hire a photographer for these things because I keep missing the great fo photographic moments because the poetic moments are blowing me away. Okay, moving on. <laughs> We're gonna shift gears a bit now. And um, one thing, so when I invite people in the community to do this, uh, often there will be someone who isn't, um, you know, identifying as a poet and, uh, regularly, but they do write poetry. And when, so when I give them this opportunity to share something, they ask me, could I share something I wrote? And of course, I can't say, no, you must not. You must go find something else. So the next, Two pairs actually are going to um, highlight community members who are sharing something that they themselves have written, and then we have a poet also responding. So, yes. So, could Roberta and Catherine please come up? <sighs> so, closest to me here, Roberta Filiki Pineski. Roberta's retired as a financial advisor and vice president at Robert W. Baird and Company after 19 years in the industry. She chairs the Sheboygan Redevelopment Authority and has served in five mayoral administrations. She serves on numerous boards, including the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters, which is how we first met. And Roberta has a great affinity for poetry and gardening. And, sh and she surprised me one day at the Art Center. She's a master gardener there, and she takes care of our plants beautifully. And Roberta will be paired, is paired, with Catherine Gall. Catherine lives in Appleton. She is limber, courageous, <laughs> addicted to dark chocolate, a story catcher, ballroom dancer, and the grief queen, a deep sleeper. Funny, her multi-genre works are widely published and she's won numerous awards for both her poetry and her short stories. Her book of poems, Life Drawing Class, appeared in 20, 2009 and includes watercolors that were created by her late husband. So please welcome Roberta and Catherine. And this really is a shift. Um, a couple of years ago, I attended, attended a workshop in Madison. Uh, and it was sponsored by the Academy, actually. And Robin Chapman, who is a published poet, um, was in charge of the workshop. And uh, she's a, an emeritus professor from UW. Before we sat down at our workshop, we all walked in, and there was a table arrayed with a number of things, a piece of yarn, a gourd, a pan. And she said, just pick something from the table. So I walked in, picked something from the table, sat down. After a little bit of instruction, Robert said, OK, now write a poem about what you have selected. I said, Oh, swell. <laughs> I began. Halfway through my writing, I realized that the pruning shears had conjured for me memories of my mother, who was an avid gardener and a garden club member. In her later years, mom had Alzheimer's. She lived for a while in an assisted living center and then on into a nursing home. To keep her engaged, the staff often asked, What's your mother interested in? What can we do to help her? And I said, well, Betty loves flowers, and she used to do flower arranging. One of the staff people said, great, we get florals deliveries here all the time. So I give you pruning shears. Pruning shears, such a lousy name. Pruning shears? They are not prunes, nor are they sheer. Plums are prunes before they dry. Sheer is the organza white kitchen curtain. Pruning shears, maybe rainbow liberators, freeing dahlia-like purple from its fragile green perch, or clipping daffodil yellow from a brown earth. 
pruning shears, creative tools from my vibrant mom, arranging a garden club entry, multi-snipping her way to yet another blue ribbon. Pruning shears, her last tool in the community dining room as her wizened and rheumatic hands cut colorful funeral flowers arcing heavenward to a new arrangement. Roberta and I have known each other for over 30 years, and I haven't seen her in a long time because I left this community. And when Lisa paired us, number one, I wasn't surprised. Number two, we weren't surprised that we both wore a red dress without <laughs> planning that. You know, there's something about synchronicity and simpatico and all of that. She sent me the poem that she was going to read, Pruning Shears, and it took me about two seconds to realize what I was going to pair with it. I'm happy to say that it appears in the current issue of Wisconsin People and Ideas. And because we are contemporaries, our mothers are clearly contemporaries from a time that was more gentle, um, people focused, not so much focus on stuff, and um, that's enough to say why my poem is called My Mother's Kitchen. Beneath the butcher wrap paper lay formica of gray with black flecks. And after my mother and her sidekick, Anita, finished wrapping T-bones, round steaks, sirloins, blade roasts, and pot roasts, they lugged in a 20-gallon pail of ground chuck and slapped and laughed the meat into patties, placing thin squares of paper between each patty for ease of separation when the burgers would go from freezer to frying pan before they taped an outer wrap and dated it in black. My father's job would be to rotate packages in the freezer designate which heifer in the barn could not be bred or milked or sold, but by next year would end up dead in my mother's kitchen <laughs> while she and Anita yacked and yacked, grateful for the homegrown kill, the time to restock the freezer for ten mouths, slaving till sweat circled their arms the little caves between their bellies where they found space to gossip about the sweltering summer, the upcoming dance with a polka band, a shotgun wedding, I love Lucy, and the growing pains of children, none of whom had yet gone vegetarian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for those memories of mothers. All right, our next pair. Could Yur and Jean come up? Yur Yang is an educator by trade, a community leader by default, and a mentor to young leaders by her passion. She's been an ELL teacher and youth leadership development advisor for 23 years in Sheboygan Area School District. And it's her mission to not only teach her students how to read and write, but also help them realize their power and potential to seize the opportunities in front of them. Dr. Jean Tobin is Professor Emerita of English with the University of Wisconsin Colleges and a co-founder of Glacial Lakes Conservancy. She's both a poet and a painter and recently had a solo show of her watercolors called In Celebration of Trees at the Fine Arts Gallery at UW Sheboygan. And so we will begin with your poem. When Lisa invited me, and I said, me, reading a poem? Um, being an EL teacher, I don't read poems a lot. Uh, although by trade, I'm an English teacher as well. 
Um, but poem is my weakness, <laughs> so I should not reveal any more than that. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you that um, when I decided to write this poem, um, you know that in life you write what, what is it that is important to you. And I know that I lived through the Vietnam War. Uh, I lived through a lot of uh, tra traumatic experiences in my life. And I thought about it and I said, um, I don't want to write about depressive stuff. What is it that is ingraining me and that is, what's, what is, it that is memorable to me? And, and those are the childhood experiences that I endured or experienced and they don't leave you. Right? Even after the, the day is over, even, even though after uh, your experience is gone and done with, but what remains is the memories and the history. And so uh, my poem is called A Day to Stay. Here you go. <clears throat> I apologize because I got the cold. So, A rooster crow ever so loudly at dusk. Mom and sister nowhere to be found. Brother gripes. Brother gripes about the brat in sight. Run, run, jungle run. Monsters, beasts, and goblins lurking under the Saturn cloud. Underneath, the sun ray penetrate trees. Fast walk across the jungle floor, hovering fog. Tiny legs slicing white puffs float. Piercing eye stares, laughters blare and conversation pierced the silent air. Tears low as the brat troll dare to show. Sun up high, beating on the open field, not a cloud in sight, but a gust of breeze on a human day on a hilltop. Blades of rice in gross way to the wind. Ears of corn listen patiently to sounds that say, vines of squash, cucumbers and beans intertwined in the mountainsides, crisps and sweet cucumbers for snacks, ginger roots, hot peppers, and rice in water on a hot, for a hot lunch. No, I apologize. Rice in water on a hot day lunch, bamboo shoots, black and white mushrooms, and palm trees, jungle treasures for a night stay, Swish, swish, scrunch, scrunch, chop, chop. On the jungle floor for days, a river, a spring seeped and drips from the mountainsides. Fish, crabs, snails, shrimps for, it, for the mainstay. Sugar cane, juicy, sweet, and chewy. Oh, what a treat. Jungle's breeze, Sweet and cool, horizon deems red, orange, and gray. Ginger roots, mushrooms, palm hearts, bamboo shoots. What a delicious soup. Fire crackling, flame flared for, to war off the beast, monsters, and goblins in the dark. Moons and stars twinkle forever bright up high. Cricket chirps, owls hoot. Beast and monster roar, all the noises in mom's embrace. The night is here to stay, away, day, stay. Thank you. The poem that I would read, the poem that you should read, in response, which is a perfect response to this wonderful poem of childhood, is Fern Hill. And it's by Dylan Thomas. And it begins, and it would have been this wonderful rolling Welch accent, very deep voice. Mm -hmm. As I was young and easy under the apple boughs. And he goes on this tour of the landscape, this magical landscape of his own childhood on a farm in Wales. But the poem is very long. so. I'm not doing it. It's here. I'm not going to do that one. I'm going to do one that I wrote, and I'm picking up just a little bit of yours poem. Um, the cucumbers, those crunchy and sweet cucumbers. In my case, peas, garden peas. 
My sister and I loved them. At that time, they didn't have pods that you would eat particularly. You threw away the pods. Um, the poem says, mo pee, grandma, mo pee, and that's just us lisping. It means more peas. Um, and then later on, I talk about those downed helicopter propellers, and what I mean are the, the pods of the peas. You know, you split them open, you threw that away, and then ate the peas. So this is for my sister. Um, it's called Of Peace and Childhood, for Marlis Joy Crager. 1937-2017. These sibling memories. More pee, Grandma, more pee, we said, and hid under her back porch, sunlight playing bright slats over our treasure, the long, thin, green gold of early garden peas. Or older, sat on her own front steps, shopping bags filled with booty between us, sharing the bounty, splitting pods with small, strong fingers, tipping over the green canoes, ripping out by a trick, a quick flick of our tongues, a row or two, single and straight, or divided and alternating of plump paddlers, little green clones. Downed helicopter propellers piled up on either side of us, and we felt so fine. Eating those endless sweets of spring, we knew we would live forever through fade-proof green June days. Or in the evening, excited to be out after dark. At the summer band concerts in our local park, we sat on a blanket Peas brought in paper bags and better than buttered popcorn. And once, when you were very little, you thought Christmas carolers were singing sleep in heavenly peas. <laughs> Oh, heavenly peas. That was beautiful. <sighs> All right, our next team is another triad, actually. So I'm going to invite Ali and Marcos and Marilyn to come to the front of the room. Alexandra Mayer de Guevara is a communication strategist at the IdeaWorks, a marketing communications agency here in Sheboygan, a new one. She serves as a board member for many things, Nourish, the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, and Planned Parenthood Wisconsin. She's part German and part Bolivian. And Ali, that's her nickname, Ali, was raised in La Paz at 12,000 feet above sea level surrounded by some of the most beautiful mountains in the world. Marcos Guevara is the husband of Ali, <laughs> and he is the code switcher and script flipper, try to say that five times fast, at the Idea Works. He helps colleagues and clients connect more deeply, more humanly, to the key members of their communities. Marilyn Zelke Window has written poetry since she was 13, and she was for many years an art teacher. She grew up with stories told to her by her Wisconsin born parents, and her father recited the poetry of Longfellow to her as a child. Her poems have appeared in many printed and online venues and several anthologies, and her fourth chapbook called Hiccups Haunt Wilson Avenue has just been released by Kelsey Press. So today, th what this team is going to do is share a poem that's in Spanish, so it will be in both languages, and then Marilyn will respond with her poem. Good afternoon, everybody. So this poem is written in a form called a decima, which was invented in the early 16th century in Spain. 
today, that form no longer exists in Spain, but flourishes all over Latin America. I recommend highly that you look up this uh, poetic form. It is used a lot nowadays uh, between decimeros, they're called, uh, throughout, like I said, throughout Latin America in a sort of battle kind of way, impromptu, uh, um, back and forth. Uh, this, this particular poem that we'll be reading is by the uh, singer-songwriter uh, Jorge Drexler, who's Uruguayan, and he kind of went crazy when he found out about decimas. I was going to start with the Spanish, I'll follow with the English translation. Hi. <laughs> so, um, this poem came to me uh, in the format of Facebook. Even though I've been loving Jorge Drexler for a long time now, he's a troubadour, and this specific uh, piece speaks a lot of the something we Latin Americans are feeling and thinking about right now, especially in the U.S. It's called Movimiento. Apenas nos pusimos en dos pies, comenzamos a migrar por la sabana, siguiendo la manada de bisontes más allá del horizonte a nuevas tierras lejanas. Los niños en la espalda y expectantes, los ojos en alerta, todo oídos, olfateando el desconcertante paisaje nuevo, desconocido. Somos una especie en viaje, no tenemos pertenencias, sino equipaje. Vamos con el polen en el viento, estamos vivos porque estamos en movimiento. Nunca estamos quietos, somos transhumantes, somos padres, hijos, nietos y bisnietos de inmigrantes. Es más mío lo que sueño que lo que toco. Yo no soy de aquí, pero tú tampoco. Yo no soy de aquí, pero tú tampoco. De ningún lado del todo, de todos lados un poco. Atravesamos desiertos, glaciares, continentes, el mundo entero de extremo a extremo, empecinados, supervivientes, el ojo en el viento y en las corrientes, la mano firme en el remo. Cargamos con nuestras guerras, nuestras canciones de cuna, nuestro rumbo hecho de versos de migraciones y hambrunas. Y ha sido así siempre desde el infinito. Fuimos la gota de agua viajando en el meteorito. Cruzamos galancia, galaxias, vacío, milenios. Buscábamos oxígeno y encontramos sueños. Apenas nos pusimos en dos pies y nos vimos en la sombra de la hoguera. Escuchamos la voz del desafío. Siempre miramos al río pensando en la otra orilla, en la otra ribera. I changed the world. Somos una especie en viaje. No tenemos pertenencias, sino equipaje. Nunca estamos quietos. Somos transhumantes. Somos padres, hijos, nietos y bisnietos de inmigrantes. Es más mío lo que sueño que lo que toco. Yo no soy de aquí, pero tú tampoco. Yo no soy de aquí, pero tú tampoco. De ningún lado del todo, y de todos lados un poco. Lo mismo con las canciones, los pájaros, los alfabetos. Si quieres que algo se muera, déjalo quieto. All right. Motion by Jorge Drexler. As soon as we stood on our two feet, we began to migrate through the savanna, following the herd of bison beyond the horizon to new lands, distant. The children on our backs and expectant, eyes alert, all ears, smelling the baffling new landscape, unknown. We're a traveling species. We don't have belongings. We have luggage. We travel with pollen in the wind, 
We're alive because we're in motion. We are never still. We're transcendent. We're parents, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of immigrants. My belongings are what I dream, more so than what I touch. I'm not from here, but you're not either. I'm not from here, but you're not either. Not from one place entirely, from everywhere a little. We cross deserts, glaciers, continents, the entire world from end to end. Stubborn, survivors, our eye to the wind and to the currents, the hand firm on the oar, carrying our wars, our lullabies, our journey made verse of migrations, of famine. And that's how it's always been from infinity. We were the drop of water on the meteorite. We crossed galaxies, the void, millennia. We were looking for oxygen. We found dreams. As soon as we stood on, two, on our two feet and saw ourselves in the shadow of the bonfire, we heard the voice of challenge. We always look at the river thinking of the other side. We're a traveling species. We don't have belongings. We have luggage. We are never still. We're transcendent. We're parents, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of immigrants. My belongings are what I dream, not so much what I touch. I'm not from here, but you're not either. I'm not from here, but you're not either. Not from one place entirely, but from everywhere a little. The same for songs, for birds, for alphabets. If you want something to die, let it be still. My children for Christmas bought me <clears throat> the Ancestry kit, and uh, you take out this little tube and you spit in it, and then you plug it up and you mail it, first class mail, and they offer you a two week free um, use of their website. I was brought up by parents that talked a lot and lots of stories about grandmothers and grandfathers and cousins, etc. So I pretty well knew where I was coming from, a little, <laughs> and everywhere a lot. So when, when this song came to me, it was like, oh yeah, I can get into this. So my, my response is called United in Dream. Sing. Sing the song of birds that rested you from slumber, from aching feet, following animals for food, from those tired arms which carried your child in dream state. Be the dream state. Praise and fear the mountains you travel. Glory in the miles of savanna you tread. Imagine in your mind the birth of crops, of sustenance, of life ongoing for family. We are united in these wishes, yours from the south of our earth, mine from the northeast, from a different sea to cross, from a different route to take, but with the same mindset, the same lyric of hope. The immigrant baggage we hoist is heavy. Our families, our families know that burden. We share that journey. Sing the troubles. Sing the trials. Sing the sickness. Cry the infant buried at sea. Then listen again. Listen to the survivors of the wind and the currents and the wars. We are united 
as genetic travelers on that water droplet, on that rock of ages, that meteorite. We seek the vapor of life, oxygen. Our cattle know the barriers. They stretch their noses beyond fences. They forever seek the sweet grasp, always beyond their grasp. We could learn from our animals. But here's the difference between us. We dream for more than sustenance of body. We see not grass, but a river, and dream about the other side. We know no barriers. We dream for more than we can touch. Our dream unites us. We are the dream. Thank you. That was beautiful. So we are coming into our last two pairs and we're doing well and we do have some refreshments after so I hope if you don't have to rush off you'll you'll stay and talk to each other I feel just like there's so many friends and people and new things to talk about in this room so let's we'll try to we don't have to zip out do we Jeannie like okay good all right <laughs> the library is not closing at 335 we'll be okay um, the next pair could Betsy and Marianne come up to the stage or the, the stage, whatever this is, the front of the room, the table. Betsy Alice retired in January from the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. She did an amazing job. She and her husband bike, fly, hike, and travel the globe. Betsy is hosting a trip to Vietnam and Cambodia next spring. And she and her husband also host nationally acclaimed singer-songwriters in her home, in their home, and they're both madly in love with the Great Lakes. So they live in the right place. Marianne Hurt was a hospice nurse in another life, and now she's a poet, a traveler, and an avid outdoor enthusiast. Her chapbook River came out from Aldrich Press in 2016. And she's just now completing a 20-year writing project called Once Upon a Tar Creek, Mining for Voices, in which she tells the story of diverse voices in rural Oklahoma. So please welcome them. Thank you. Oh, yes, and I have read her chapbook, River, and I highly recommend it. It was really just some lovely moments for me. To read that, as some of you know, my daughter Allie is in the midst of trying to eradicate a particularly aggressive cancer, and she lives and works and plays a lot in Denver every day with all the joy that she can muster. When she got the news that the cancer had metastasized early this year, it was about the time that Lisa invited me to share a poem with this group, and I just couldn't connect even thoughts together at that time. As I wandered her apartment, I hurried there, wondering somewhat helplessly what I could do or say in these moments. I noticed she had a copy of Desiderata on her fridge, along with hundreds of other things. I read it again with new eyes after 45 years. That number just came to me today, and I was amazed. I am certain of one thing, that each day, each moment for all of us is new and full of love everywhere to be found. So I read Desiderata, which appeared in my college dorm on many, many walls, um, and was read by um, uh, 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 Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy, I couldn't remember his first name. Um, I tried his voice, it didn't work, so I'm going to use my own. He wrote this in 1927. It has endured all these years, not 3,000 years, um, but all these years. It was by Max Ehrman. Desiderata, it means desired things. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence 
as far as possible without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others. Even the dull and the ignorant, they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons, they are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourselves with others, you may become vain and bitter. For always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love. For in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune, but do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him or her to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. Thank you. I had never met Betsy before two weeks ago. Right. And I think we were supposed to meet each other. Yeah. And I think I really need to meet your daughter now. Yeah, you do. <laughs> okay, and I think this poem kind of it's for your daughter, actually. The poem is called A Brave and Daring Life. Uh, I have a little epigraph, a little introduction from a book called Solidary Places by Joan Vanderdahl Schrader. And she has a line in her book that says, real love obligates us to live a brave and daring life. It is a fire. This is a brave and daring life. There are rules you break and wait for an infernal shoe to drop, but dance in the fire anyway sparks flying, chasing, but still know in your deepest heart the flame will be enough to save your life full of blaze and light. I love when the partners become friends. This has happened every year, so makes me really happy. Before we go to our last pair, a uh, couple housekeeping things. I mentioned the snacks already. I'm going to be turning uh, on some music at the end of this, and it's the Jorge Drexler um, song that we heard the lyrics to. So it's going to be on the screen with a little, really cool little animation. Oh, no, we have the actual mu Well, we'll have something. There'll be music. Um, and also... <laughs> I want to um, say this now to invite you to an event on Saturday, May 19th um, at 10 in the morning at Maywood. This is a, the eighth annual Language of Nature poetry reading and discussion that Marianne Hurt, who was just up here, and Georgia Rossmeyer and Marilyn Zelke Window uh, have been organizing for the last seven years and they bring people together at Maywood and um, everyone shares nature poetry and you sit in that beautiful room and see the trees and it's lovely and after and there's good snacks Marilyn is an excellent baker and um, they do a, a walk around Maywood afterward if you can stay so it's a great morning again it's 10 to noon on Saturday May 19th the language of nature and we hope that you'll be there I'll be there all right, could our last pair come to the stage? And 
I'm excited about this pair because this is the one that to me is the most like Dancing with the Stars because they're going to share one poem together. And so we have David Benton. David has spent nearly 15 years serving the community by running mentoring programs for at-risk and disengaged youth between the ages of 10 and 18. In 2016, David founded Dream Big Academy, a project that supports young people to get out of their comfort zone, invest in themselves, and follow their dreams. Sylvia Cavanaugh is originally from Pennsylvania, and she's now a teacher at North High, where she teaches African and Asian cultural studies. She's a Pushcart Prize nominee and a contributing editor to Verse Virtual. And her second checkbook, which is at the back of the room, called Angular Embrace, is just out from Kelsey Press. So I will let David introduce the poem. Oh, and I know one other thing I wanted to say. When you're meandering around having snacks, check out the back table, because all the different books that the poems have come from today are back there. And you'll find some really great stuff, including a children's book version of the poem that you're about to hear. So. Just wanted to say that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, as Lisa stated, um, I've been in uh, this area for about 16 years. I'm actually, origi I originally came from uh, Aurora, Colorado, so I'm very familiar with Denver, Colorado. Um, and I think uh, a lot of my story ties into the reason why I selected the poem I selected um, is because I think we all come from different aspects of life, um, and we're all searching for our belonging, um, our sense of compassion, love, growth. Um, and you know, in this day and age where we're riddled by wars or controversy or turmoil, um, oftentimes we just need to look to the person next to us to find our, our peace and comfort. Um, and so I selected a poem by Richard Blanco, One Day, originally written in 1968, um, and then was reused by uh, for uh, President Barack Obama's presidential inauguration, January 21st, 2013. <clears throat> One sun rose on us today, kindled over the shores, peeking over the Smokies, gre uh, greeting the faces of the Great Lakes, spreading a simple truth across the Great Plains, then charging across the Rockies. One light waking up rooftops, under each one a story told by our silent gestures moving behind windows. My face, your face, million of faces in the morning mirror, each one yawning to life, crescendoing into our day, pencil yellow school buses, the rhythm of traffic lights. Fruit stands, apples, limes, oranges, arrayed like rainbows. Begging for our praise, silver trucks heavy with oil or paper, bricks or milk, teeming along the highway alongside us. On our way to clean tables, read ledgers or save lives, to teach geometry or ring up groceries as my mother did for 20 years so I could write this poem. All of us as vital as the one light we move through. The same light on the blackboards with lessons for today. Equations to solve, history to question, atoms to imagine. The I have a dream, we keep dreaming. Or the impossible vocabulary of sorrow that won't explain the empty desks of 20 children marked absent today and forever. Many prayers, but one light breathing color into stained glass windows. Life into the faces of bronze statues. Warmth onto the steps of our museums and park benches as mothers watch children slide into the day. One ground. Our, our ground, ground rooting us to, to every stalk of corn, every head of wheat sown by sweat and hands, hands glimmering coal or planting windmills in the deserts and hilltops to keep us warm, hands digging trenches, rooting pipes and cables, hands as warm 
as my father's cutting sugar cane, so my brother and I could have books and shoes. The dust of farms and deserts, cities and plains, mingled by one wind, our breath, breathe. Hear it through the day's gorgeous din of honking cabs, buses launching down avenues, the symphony of footsteps, guitars, and screeching subways, the unexpected bird song on your clothesline. Here, squeaking playground sing swings, trains whistling are the whispers across the cafe tables. Hear the doors we open for each other all day, saying hello. Shalom. Bonjour. Howdy. Namaste. Or buenos dias. To in the language, language my, my mother taught, taught me, in, in every language, language spoken in into one, one wind, carrying, carrying our, our lives without, without prejudice, prejudice, as these words break from my lips. One sky, since the Appalachians and the Sierra claim their majestics, and the Mississippi and Colorado work their way to the sea, thank the work of our hands. Weaving still into bridges, finishing one more report for the boss on time, stitching another wound, our uniform, the first brush stroke on a portrait, or the last floor of the Freedom Tower, jetting into the sky that yields to our resiliency. One sky toward which we sometimes lift our eyes, tired from work, some days guessing at the weather of our lives, some days giving thanks for a love that loves you back, sometimes praising a mother who knew how to give, or forgiving a father who couldn't give what you wanted. We head home through the gloss of the rain or the weight of the snow, or the plume blush of dust, but always home, always under one sky, our sky, Always one moon like a silent drum tapping on the rooftop of every window of one country. All of us. Facing the stars. Hope. A new constellation waiting for us to map it. Waiting for us to name it. Together. together. That was awesomely beautiful. And did you two coordinate the wearing of blue because you looked super fabulous. I mean, we had the red dresses and we had the blue shirts. It was awesome. It's really good. Well, this brings us to the end of the sharing of poetic pairings today. Thank you all so much for all your words, whether they came from a poet, a songwriter, yourself. It was really wonderful. I'm super excited. And uh, we're going to do this event again, right, Jeannie, next year in April. So stay tuned. Meanwhile, read poetry, share poetry, speak poetry, uh, be together, love each other, eat cookies. And I'm, I want you all to chit chat now. I know some people might have to run out, but enjoy each other's company. And I'm going to put on the um, video so we can hear the Jorge Drexler song. So um, thank you all very much. And thank you to Mead Public Library. <laughs>